di SM Motor 2019. Saya Ricky Jenardi dan saya akan jadi moderator. Semangat sekali ya, meskipun udah udah sesi yang belakang, tapi masih terasa semangat ini belajarnya. Baik, hmm, saya pengen melihat lebih jauh dari semangat ini dulu. Jadi kalau bisa saya ini bapak ibu berdiri dulu, sekarang. Terus sekarang. Iya berdiri maksudnya tidak duduk bapak ibu. Betul sekali. Iya baik. Jadi saya akan pecah menjadi empat grup. Jadi untuk kursi yang satu, dua, tiga, empat dari depan ini grup satu. Terus grup 2 adalah yang di belakangnya, sama juga grup 3, 4 kursi yang di depan, dan 4 di belakang adalah grup 4. Tenang saja, hingga main jumlah-jumlah, jadi tidak usah takut yang grupnya sedikit orang. Jadi, apa yang saya ingin kalian lakukan adalah, nanti ketika saya mengatakan sebuah kode, kalian harus membuat grup dengan angka tertentu. Contoh, 3. Tiga kira-kira apa sih yang bentuknya tiga itu kayak fidget spinner lah ya Jadi kita buat kode buat tiga itu fidget spinner Karena itu fidget spinner yang diputar-putar di jari itu loh uh, Saya nggak tahu kalau ada yang dua atau empat cuma yang saya punya yang tiga Jadi ya kalau yang kedua atau empat nanti ini agak lama Jadi kalau misalnya saya bilang spinner nanti kalian harus buat grup tiga orang Dan harus orang yang berbeda dari grup kalian ini jadi grup 1, 2 harus cari orang dari grup 2 Atau grup 2 harus cari dari grup 4 Dan untuk 5, coba, coba 5 kira-kira apa sih yang 5? Jari Oke, okay, mungkin kita pakai jari Jadi 3 fidget spinner, 5 jari, 7 Kira-kira apa yang 7 coba? Minggu, ya boleh Jadi kita ingat ya Kalau 3 itu apa? Spinner, 5 Jari tujuh, oke. Okay, jadi setiap kali saya bilang contoh yang minggu semuanya harus cari grup yang ada tujuh orang, oke. Okay? Dan orangnya itu harus berbeda dengan grup kalian sendiri, oke. Okay? Di sini mengerti, baiklah. Jadi kalau misalnya kalau grupnya tuh boleh pegangan tangan atau desak-desakan boleh. Jadi kalau ada yang lebih ada yang kurang itu bakal dipanggil ke depan nanti hukumannya nanti saya coba pikirkan dulu. Baiklah. Kita bisa mulai sekarang Baik Untuk kata pertama Jari Yeah, 
berbicara sesi kita pada hari ini Beliau itu merupakan pribadi yang sangat humble sekali Dan dia juga merupakan kepala sekolah Dari salah satu international school terbesar di Medan Yaitu Singapore International School Dan hari ini kita beruntung sekali untuk mendapatkan kesempatan Untuk diinspirasi dari pengalaman dan cerita Cara bagaimana dia mencapai kesuksesan dia sampai pada hari ini Pria yang luar biasa ini bernama Michael Sim Tapi hari ini dia meminta untuk dipanggil dengan nama Big Mike. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please give a big round of applause for Big Mike. Regrets, 
But I'm really here today to tell you that you can still make mistakes and do well in life. All right? Now, I'm not talking about failing a test. I'm not talking about showing up for work late. I'm talking about far, far worse things. Now, I know my audience here is mixed. So we have teenagers up to people who own very successful businesses in this room. However, this story hopefully makes you put your life into perspective and understand the different things that can happen in someone's life and also make you appreciate what you have and what you've been through. So, let me start. In, in, I assume everybody here is, well, for the most part, from Indonesia? Yes? Warga Negara Indonesia? Yes, okay. Um, can I ask, when did you get your first job? Shout out, shout out an age. 16, 17, 18? 16. So I had my first job when I was 14, okay? So I'm still in school. Uh, obviously, 14 years old. This is not a full-time job, I'm not working in an office. Okay? 14 years old, today I'm 35. Alright? I look much older than 35, but I'm still young in heart. But, you know, it depends on who you ask, different things in your life, depending on your job, depending on who you're married to, they may cause more stress. Okay? So I'm only 35, so I don't think I'm too much of a grandfather yet. Alright? So, when I was 14, my first job, working in a factory. Alright? Working in a factory. Now, what did it do in a factory? So, after school, school finished for me at 3.30 every day. I would say about in grade 8. So, what is that here? SMP Duma? Okay? And boom, this is what I used to do. Do you all have shorts that have these strings on them? Right? So, I used to sit at a desk with a pile of material that were shorts and I have to put that lace inside. People don't know how, how, how this process happens. So all you have to do is take a hanger, bend it out, wrap the lace around it, and you put it in the hole. And I did that when I was 14 for money. Yeah, not bad. I mean, for a kid who's in grade eight, $500 extra a month at that time was great, right? So if you can't legally work in Canada until you're 16, okay? So I was 14, so this is the only job you could get. Other things we used to do, we used to go down to people's uh, driveways when it snow, shovel their snow, and they get paid like $20. So what is that? Mm, about your rapper's reboot, okay? Next. Fifteen years old. No, you, 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 the factory is a hard one to relate to. It wasn't child labor, but I volunteered for it again. Wendy's. Oh, sorry. Go back. Wendy's. Boom. You all know Wendy's? Yes. I'm sure you do. Uh, when I first came to Medan, so I've been in Medan, and I don't want to ruin my story here, but I've been in Medan since 2007. Right? So, super much I'm in Indonesia. I can speak Bahasa as well. Now, I don't think I'm terrible at Bahasa, but my wife thinks I'm terrible. <laughs> I learned my Bahasa in Indonesia from the chat drivers. When 2007, there was no Gojek, and there was no Grab. There was only the white taxi, I forgot the name of it. Express. There wasn't even Uber here yet, right? So let alone, there was no Wendy's at the time. Uh, so I was working at Wendy's. Again, a normal part-time job for students, all right? Standing there, flip the burger, flip the burger. Yeah, absolutely terrible. 
right? But again, every month, seven hundred dollars. Can't complain. Seven hundred dollars. That's minimum wage in Canada at that time. But not bad. Seven hundred dollars. Learn to work. You know, we have problems with time management as adults, as kids. Easy, understand. But as adults, how much problems do you have managing your time? I have to work. I have to show my boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife attention. You have to eat, right? If you have kids, that even adds more problems. Managing time is very difficult, right? The more experience you have, the better it is, because you get to understand how to deal with people. And if you're alone in this world, you have a lot less stress to worry about. 90% of my life is doing stuff for other people. Now, I don't know about you, but if I think about my life, I have to do groceries, I have to work, I have to play with my son, I have to buy purses for my wife, right? All these things, I have to make sure she's happy. You know, I don't know for women, but me, I have a say, a personal say, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> so, you know, working throughout high school is a very normal thing in Canada. Everybody I knew had a job, worked. When I was 16, I got my first job. CIBC, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. So I worked here at the bank. Now, honestly, and I'll tell you a little secret, I don't judge my mother. My mother is a very high-ranking banking official in CIBC. She was able to make me 18 years old when I was actually only 16 years old. <laughs> uh, so since everybody was so scared of her, uh, I was able to get a job. My first job, really, so this is my first real nice job that I liked, right? Uh, I went to the bank and I was a teller, bank teller. If you ever, ever been to a bank, you know that going to the bank is one of the worst things in the world. The lineups are long, right? The people are so slow. It takes, you, you need like 10 pieces of ID to get your own money, right? This is life in the bank. So I worked here for about two years. And I learned a lot because you meet people from all walks of life. Again, think about this. So I'm 35 now, this is when I was 16 years old. I had, uh, we had a branch in a mall. So the lineup was, we called it like the six hour lineup. Because you could go at it, go at it, work, and people would not move. <laughs> six hours. Now, I don't know about you, but today, I really don't have to go into a bank. Everything can be done on my phone, right? Everything can be done on my phone. So don't have any problems there. Um, I hate going into the banks in any country, right? Not just not just in Canada. Banks are terrible, but I really appreciate people who work in banks if you work in a bank because you have to deal with people who are always angry, right? Dealing with angry people is very difficult. So this is my first chance to learn some of the skills I use today as a principal. Now, I'm a principal, if you didn't already know. I have lots of people that I deal with, but people only come to see the principal when it's something bad. Okay? Sometimes I ask myself, who's more scared? If I call a student to come to my office, they're pretty scared. But if I call a mom or dad at work, they're even more scared. Why is the principal calling me something bad? Because you know it's bad news, right? You know, nobody comes to your job and says, you're doing a great job, right? They only tell you when something's wrong, right? But that's life, right? That's life, what are you gonna do? Right, that's life. So the bank was fine, super fine. A lot of experience, you know, and as a 16 year old kid, seeing all the money, how you learn so much. You sit there, how ATM machines work, and you figure it out. You see, oh, take all these stacks of cash, 
Now, one of the, I'll tell you a crazy story about working in the bank. One, of course, working in the bank, I'll tell you a secret, I don't know if you know. You know, in the movies, they have that, like, they show you the bank tower, and they have a button that they press for it. That's not real. It is not real. That is a movie thing. All right? There is no that. Okay? And also, they, they show people who, you know, they, they open up the vault, right? Most bank's vaults don't look like that. Okay. Um, so, working in the bank. I'm a big guy. Alright? I only see one other guy in this group who looks like he's the same size as me. Alright? Uh, but he's in better shape, so I'm not going to say who he is because he looks a lot better looking than I am. Now, when we worked at the bank, they would shift me around to different branches because I'm a big guy. I can throw off the robber. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And if you worked in a bank, for insurance purposes, they will tell you, never, ever try to be a hero. And that's true. And if you're in a bank, just give the money. It's not your money. <laughs> right? It's not my money. He's not taking money out of my pocket. He's taking the bank's money. That's insured. Right? There's money. The, the money will be covered. Right? But there's always people who want to fight. Fight the robber. So this guy came in. So I've been robbed three times. Okay? Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had a gun to your face. It's scary. People who say they're experts, they can look at a gun and say, oh, that's fake. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. Imagine, like, there's a gun to your face. Your heart is beating like crazy. I had a gun to my face. The guy, well, this guy. <laughs> He's on the other side of the car. Gun to my face. And then didn't say anything. All he did was take a note out, put a note on the counter, and it said, put all the money in the bank. Now, again, why this is ridiculous? Again, another secret, the banking secret I will tell you. The, the, the tellers themselves, they only are allowed to keep a certain amount of money in that top drawer. Right? So, at, at my bank at this time, we're only allowed to keep $1,200, which is about, let's say, dual class two time, okay, in the top drawer. Uh, if you, in Canada, the rule, the, the law is, if you do a robbery, you're going to go to jail for minimum 10 years, with an additional 20 years. So this guy was looking at 30 years for 12 million rupiah. <laughs> Not worth it. Not worth it. So, of course, yes, I know, I can trade. Give the money, this is all I have. And then inside, every teller has what we call uh, mark bills, okay? They're usually a small denomination. So in this case, there were the $10 bills were marked. So then when it passed a certain amount of meters outside the bank, it explodes, right? And there's a purple dye, a purple dye that you could not get off. So this guy, give him all money, he runs up, and then caught within an hour. I had no idea how many undercover cops in general in the world there are. I've seen crimes in Indonesia. I've seen crimes here, serious crimes. And then you see all these guys show up with their badge, jean shorts, and they have guns. I'm like, who is this guy? Man, he's a cop. He's a real cop. They're not, so there's a lot of undercover cops. So they're not on that day, that winter day. Cops came, scrummed the bank, and I said, oh man, there's like 12 undercover cops. They called me like, you know, not like I said. So it was really, really a wake-up call. Okay, I, I don't want to tell, okay, I'll tell you one more bank robbery story. This one was a little bit worse, so I was at another branch again, and then five guys came in with not pistols, okay? Guys with pistols are scary. Guys with AKs, those, these are serious. Right? So they put, basically what happened was very much like a movie. And sometimes you have these moments in your life where you feel like it's a movie. I don't know what's going on right now. And it feels like it's taking forever. Like it feels like it's an hour long thing that's happening to you meanwhile it's only a minute and a half. Right? And these moments in your life, this is one of these moments in my life. You know, it felt like a movie. Is this really happening? 
happening to you? Right? So they came up, jumped up on the counters, partying their AKs and everybody told everybody to go to the vault. And we really got locked into the vault. And that was a very serious one. Because I don't know about you, but I don't like to be locked in. I'm a big guy. I don't want to be in the space that's, you know, the vault was smaller than this room. About half the size of this room. So, you know, being in there with like 10 other people, and you know, most of the time, everybody's panicked, right? Everybody's panicked. I don't know how to convey that kind of feeling. Um, you're on an airplane, you start feeling the turbulence, everybody starts praying, you know, starts screaming, right? That kind of feeling, uh, unless you had a gun right to your face, it's really, really sad. It's sad because you're so helpless and you don't know what to do. Uh, so, you know, again, working in the bag. Uh, I didn't want to tell those bag stories, but okay, so working in the bag. Now, how did I get caught? Before I jump to this one, how did I get caught being 16 years old working in the bag? Because of my grandma. <laughs> so when I turned 18 years old, so I've been telling all my other colleagues that I was like 21. And I was leaving high school telling everybody that I was a second year university uh, student and there was a girl who I really liked. And you know, I've been trying to talk to her, trying to convince her uh, that you know she should date me. And then well, my grandma used to, my grandma's house was close to this branch. So she would come in every Sunday. And then one time it was my birthday, she came, she gave me a card at work. So embarrassing. So embarrassing. Right? But you know, when you get a card from your grandma, you know what's inside, right? Money, right? So, of course, I'm, I'm happy to receive it, but you know, I feel my face turning red. So, of course, I open the card, and then it says, you know, happy 18th birthday. So, I try to hide the card, and the girl, at the end of the day, we have to balance our tills, count the money, debits equal credits with your cash. I had my card hidden. And what we do is, so after I balance my till, I have to check somebody else's work. So she was checking my work, she saw the card, she's like, really, T? Oh, ruin, ruin. So that was, uh, that's how I got caught. So, you know, after working at the bed, got a job for the government, city of Toronto. Now this began my process of changing my life. Um, this is the first time I actually worked with kids. So I spent a lot of time working with adults. Now I work with kids, because when I jumped at the city of Toronto, I was a basketball coach, I was a camp counselor, and I also was a hockey rink attendant. If you have been to a cold country, and you see where they ice skate, I was the guy who got on the big machine called the Zamboni, and then I made sure it's clean, make sure there's no fights, because hockey there's a lot of fights. And you know, that was great because it opened up my eyes. Working with kids, it's so rewarding. Working with adults, not so much. Everybody knows everything. Everybody wants to talk about what school they went to, how smart they are, how much money they have. Oh, is that, new, is that a new Rolex submarine? Uh, working with kids is nice, it humbles you, right? It makes you remember what's important. The first time in my life, I had somebody come to me and tell me that I'm their hero. Nobody's ever said that to me. Working with kids, kids will say that to me. Now, it's not for everybody. Working with kids is very difficult as well. And can be very testing. But this time in my life, I was going through a lot of bad things. So this woke me up. I had a mom uh, one day who came to me and said, hey, because of you, my son is not in jail. Because of you, my son's not hanging out on the corner selling drugs. And I was like, whoa, I made this crazy impact on somebody's family just by being me, a guy going to a recreational center and talking. So because they spent, they would, these kids would come after school and hang out, and they lived in a neighborhood that was really bad. 
but they would hang out and they had brothers that were in jail. And they would come and hang out with me. So, again, another perspective on life through experience. Now, my last job before I came here was at this place called Home Depot. Don't know if you know Home Depot. It's very similar to Ace Hardware, except 30 times bigger. If you go to a Home Depot uh, store, it's about the size of this campus. It's huge, okay? They're huge. They have everything you can think of and need. Um, so, Home Depot is a big, very big brand in North America, out of Atlanta. And I used to work there, customer service, and cut keys. You got a key for your house, you need a copy, I'll cut it for you. You want to learn how to put a picture on the wall, how to do it right, I'll show you how. Right? Fix locks, all that. So, customer service, great. Customer service here was one of the best things I learned. How to deal with people. How to deal with people. Now, the thing is, you can only learn a lot of this stuff through experience. Sitting in a classroom is not going to teach you how to deal with people. Right? The skills you can learn in a classroom, that's different. That's different. But you know what? Almost all of the jobs in the next 20 years are going to be pretty much taken away by artificial intelligence. Right? So, we're going to have to figure out how to adapt. Best part about this Home Depot job was when I told everybody I was leaving Home Depot to go to Indonesia. Now, I worked with a lot of guys at Home Depot. Big dudes, big guys, tough guys from Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Iran, and you know what they all told me? Indonesia is very dangerous. <laughs> you guys are from like all the countries I hear about on the news every day. And you're telling me Indonesia is very dangerous? <laughs> I was really worried coming here. I was really worried coming. Because, you know, again, I have people from these countries, you know, that I've known for a couple of years who have telling me to be careful. And I'm thinking to myself, if you, that's what you're saying about Indonesia, what would you say about your own country? <laughs> now, again, I am not a judge. I am not going to listen to what people say until I have an experience myself. Right? People will tell me, oh, airline, this airline is terrible. But am I like my airline? Because it should be good. Depends on your experience, right? So, that's why I came. That's why I came. Now, I'm going to send us back a little bit and talk about the dark days. Right. Now, this time in my life is really bad. All right, did a lot of bad things. If you don't want to hear these bad things, better cover your ears. All right, because this is some stuff that I'm not proud of. Stuff that's not on my Instagram. All right, stuff that I'm not happy with that I did, stuff that I regret. Um, this was part of us. Got my first tattoo when I was 16 years old. People tell me if you have a tattoo, you're a bad person. I fit the description of a bad person. Big, tattoos, earring, shape head. <laughs> right? People say you can be criminal. You can be a good criminal. You fit the profile. You, you Google principle. Nothing like me will come up. <laughs> I promise you. Nothing like me will come up. Right? Here it's different. In Canada and in the US, the place where you live determines where you go to school. Okay, so for example, to put it in perspective, everybody who lived in like complex Malibu would all go to one school. Everybody who lived in Tasky would go to one school. Right? They could not cross. So if you're from the same neighborhood, you all go to the same school. Now where I'm from. You better stick together with your friends. If your friend has a problem, it means everybody in your neighborhood has that same problem. If I see my friend getting beat up, I'm gonna go jump. My high school had metal detectors. Okay? 
your airport didn't have as good security. Palanamu didn't have as good security as my high school. Okay? We had metal detectors. We also had Friday sweep. Friday sweep is when the police come into the school with the German shepherd and they walk by all of the lockers. So my high school had about 3,000 kids, right? 3,000 kids walking by, they walk, they walk by all the lockers with the German Shepherd. When the German Shepherd, which is a dog, you know what I'm saying? The dog, they walk by with the dog, the German Shepherd, he's a dog. And when the German Shepherd sits, it means there's drugs or a gun in that locker. And I've seen so many people sitting in class get arrested. Please would come into the class, because all the lockers are registered. So if you happen to be a guy who was, had a girlfriend who was very vulnerable, that guy may have put those drugs in your girlfriend's locker, and in his girlfriend's locker, sorry. And then the girlfriend gets arrested, because smart drug dealers are not gonna put drugs in their own locker with the with the registration tag. They're gonna put it somebody else's on. So I've seen so many girls who fell in love with these guys. Big gold chains, new, new shoes, right? They fell in love with these guys. And these guys would put drugs in the locker of the door. We'd be sitting there at that girl is usually a very smart student, right? It's what opposites attract, right? You always have the girl who's like a great student, beautiful, and then she wants the guy who's obviously destined to be a criminal. Opposites of trap. Now, the girl would get arrested, and then there's a big, big problem. But this was high school life in Toronto. I'm from Toronto. I don't know if you know that. I'm sure you've heard of people from Toronto, Toronto Raptors, Drake, Weekend. All right. Story time. Story time. Okay. This is my high school. Picture of my high school. West Hill. West Hill Kaluchi Institute. All right. Grade nine to grade twelve. All done here. Now I was the last one to go through a system that had grade thirteen. But West Hill is a bad school. Like I said, please stop. Sweet, sweet Friday sweet. Very scary. Fights every day. Fights every day. You can now. I've seen this done in Indonesia a lot. This is, and I've seen it done in many different countries. I'm sure you may have done this already. If you're trying to tip somebody and you don't want to make a big scene, you put the bill in your hand, you shake hands, and you pass the money to the other person. Somebody who carries your bags, you know, somebody who helps you, you know, so you, you, you tip them like that. Very rarely are you fumbling through your purse or your wallet and then taking out the money and giving them the money. You don't want to make a scene. Take out a little bit. You go to another country. A lot of countries in the Caribbean, it's the same way. Mexico, it's the same way. Take a big 50,000 out. Tip, shake hands. Now, here, if you go talk to anybody in Toronto, they can do the opposite. Or they can do more, I should say. They'll have a little bit of drugs in their hand. We'll just shake hands. I'll give you the drugs, you'll send me the money. All in one action. Can't see it. You know, CCTV can't see it. They just see people shaking hands. Right? Biggest problem I had at school. So like I said, different schools had different neighborhoods. One day, from the other school. So we have two types of school in Canada, in Ontario. Public school and Catholic school. So you can only go to one of those, public school, Catholic school. The guys from the Catholic school down the road, Catholic school down the road, Pope, Pope John Paul. The guys from Pope John Paul came down to come and fight me. So I had like six guys ready to come and fight me. Right? I'm a big guy. You can't find six guys. All right? Now, again, I don't know how many of you have ever been in a real fight. Okay? It's not like the movies, where everybody makes a circle and they give you space to fight, right? And then they give you a kick. It's not like that, right? Everybody is just running everywhere. There's chaos everywhere. Now, maybe you haven't been in a fight, but maybe you've seen a fight. 
Seeing a fight also makes your heart beat, right? Anything from a fight to people arguing on the road, right? It gets you nervous because you don't want to fight. You don't want to see people get hurt, right? But you know, again, normal, normal walk of life in high school. Now, we we'll finish the story. Sorry, six guys came to fight me and they got beat up pretty bad. But if there was YouTube at that time, this fight would have been on YouTube. Because it was so good, because everybody who came to find me was really skinny and really small. But there's still six of them. There's still six of them. So I picked up some guys and I threw them down. A couple of arms got broken. And then finally, after I got beat up, my friends who were inside the school came out with their guns and saved me. So again, growing up in the same neighborhood, this really helped. The fight stories go on and on and on. No, like I said, wasn't a nice guy at this time. I'm a super nice guy now. I'm a super nice guy. You know, you need help? I'll help you. My first, my first week in Indonesia, I was with uh, a bed check driver. He used to take me everywhere. And then we saw a guy. He looked like he was a very well off guy. He was, he was driving a Subaru Impreza at that time. And it was souped up. Nice paint job, nice work. But the car broke down. So here was this guy pushing in the middle of the road, on uh, the middle of Jalan Katimura. Okay? So it's, it's a fairly busy street. And he's pushing. He's at one, he's outside the car, one hand on the steering wheel, pushing the car. I jump out of the bench out, and then I go and help. Help push. He just tried to get this car to the side of the road. Pushing the car is more than a one hand job. So, helped him. Bed tech driver said, why do you do that? But just help him, right? Uh, so, I'm very helpful guy now. You know, don't, don't hold any of this stuff against me. All right? Uh, I will not do any of this stuff ever again in my life, now that I have a, a son, right? Uh, but, you know, this is just a fact of life. I think if you talk to most people from where I'm from, they're going to tell you the same stories. Um, another fight story. I mean, let's just call them Gang 1 and Gang 2 at my school. Got in a big fight. Then they had Gang 2 call their friends who were older from their neighborhood. So Gang 2 was from neighborhood B, Gang 1 is from neighborhood A. We all went to the same high school, got in a big fight. The next thing you know, Boris Wagon, old Boris Wagon comes up to the school. The parking lot right here so pulls up off the road right here. Boom! Pops open the trunk. Everybody grabs guns. Everybody grabs guns. And you're so scared. Everybody's grabbing guns. You don't have guns. They call their friends from their neighborhood to come and bring the guns. Start shooting everywhere. Start shooting everywhere. Again, I don't know how to get it through your head, but this thing seemed like it took like an hour. An hour of bullets flying. Two people died. Two people died. I did not get hit by a bullet, I only got stabbed. Right? Before, before all of this really kicked off, I was stabbed. Now, I'm not proud of that. I now have a tattoo that covers up stabbing. So now nobody will know, unless you tell. <laughs> but again, you know, everywhere. I can go into more details, but I keep getting a sign that I'm talking too much. Okay. Um, this was, this is a, not a real scene, I just grabbed a photo, okay? Now this one, my friend was friends with another drug dealer, okay? This drug dealer said that me and him had to do this thing or else they would go and hurt our family. Okay, so what we were asked to do was go to somebody else's apartment and steal everything from them. Now, again, when do people do crazy things in times of desperation? Can I, at that time, there was no way 18-year-old Michael could say no. Because I'm thinking about my mom and dad. What if these guys, these crazy guys come to my house? Right? So we went to his house, went to his apartment, broke down the door, 
tied them up. Rip dirty. And then the only thing I remember, I remember two things from that night. Breaking the door down and the hinges on the door coming off. And then we saw four pit bulls. Now, not grown pit bulls, baby pit bulls. Now, in Canada at that time, in Toronto at that time, one pit bull was worth about $3,000. Right? So about, take a pull of Jutta for one dollar. So my friend grabs, my friend who were with me, grabs the guns, the money, and I'm grabbing the <laughs> Right, so that was the only funny thing about that night, because I was so scared. I was so scared, because first I'm thinking, man, this is really scary. You've done something bad in your life, knowing it's bad, going into it, you already feel terrible. Let alone, for this thing, I can get killed. Right? If, if somebody comes into your house, you have the right to defend your house and your family. I can get killed right now, but that was the thing that, of those serious, serious consequences. So what happened to change me? Okay. What happened to change me? Very simple. One day, somebody broke into my house. They broke into my house. My brother, my littlest brother, who who now is the biggest guy, was at home. Somebody broke into the house to try to rob our house. And it was because of me. How did I know it was because of me? Because they were only in my room. They didn't go for my mom's jewelry. They didn't go for my dad's stuff. They went to my room, searched all the drawers, searched everything. To this day, we don't know what they've been looking for. But I always had the mentality, you do something to me, I'm fine with it. You leave everybody in my family alone. Right? Because I was a bad guy. Karma will always catch you. You do bad things, so karma caught me. And that was it. Changed my life. Boom. Made the journey. That's exactly where I'm from. That's exactly where we are now. Been in Medet for 12 years. But I'm born in Medet, and I'm Medet. <laughs> and I'm proud. I'm proud about being from Medet. When I travel, I travel a lot. I'm on a plane about three times a month, going to different cities. And I'm always proud to say, I'm not just from Indonesia, I'm from Medet. Yeah. Okay? Because I love this place. Yes. You know, I'm very proud to be born in Medet. And I don't care what people think. You know, Jakarta people, Surabaya people, Bangladesh people. Everybody has a different view of what Medan people are. But I'm very proud. I don't care. Right? I'm very proud to be from Medan. And I let people know. So I came to Indonesia. And my first job was at this school. All right? It's called the Judith. I worked here as a classroom teacher. Super great experience. I didn't expect to stay here. My plan, after graduating university in the field of business, stay here in Indonesia for one year, and then go back to Canada. But it didn't work out like that. It's been great. Indonesia is so great. My dad is so great. Everybody's super nice. I don't care. I don't care. I can only judge based on my experience. Has anything, has any criminal activity ever happened to me in 12 years? No. No, I'm very happy about that. People do bad things all the time. It's gonna happen, right? I'll get caught up. But everybody's been super nice. And, I'm, and I love them. And you know, people are very welcoming. Now, I, people are very friendly, and they love giving directions when you're lost. Directions are never really accurate. Uh, but you know, they're super friendly and really to help. So I was started at the school for four years now, uh, and moved to, Singapore International School. Right? Love this school. School changed my life. Started off as a P. This is me in 2011 with all my all my little kids. But I started off as a third grade teacher, and now I run a multi-million dollar branch. Anybody can do anything. It's about hard work and attitude. Right? End of story. I don't care. I always tell people, I don't care what degree you have. People who have master's degrees, PhD degrees, I don't care. Because what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Not related to that degree. What's your attitude? Are you going to come to work every day? Are you going to work hard every day? I'm not asking people to give their lives. I'm asking them to understand the cause and work together. 
Um, so, a couple of other stuff that I did. Supposed to finish up, wrap it up, okay. Um, last thing, mistakes. You gotta make mistakes, all right? Mistakes have the power to turn you into something better than you were before. But it's only gonna come back to you. I have a lot of friends in jail right now. You know what the number one currency, what's the number one currency in every jail in every country? Cigarettes. Right? In Indonesia, when you go to business on Egypt, you better bring cigarettes. Right? Same thing in Canada. So I see my friends, they're in jail. I made the choice. So mistakes have the power. It's going to come down to you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Mark, as a matter of fact, I can say that we are really proud and honored to be part of your greatness and your power and passion in making a better education in Medan. So thank you very much once again. Give a big round of applause for Mr. Mark. Thank you. Saya berharap sesi ini dapat menginspirasi Bapak Ibu sekalian bagaimana seseorang berawal dari yang latar belakangnya berbeda sekali dari banyak kejahatan sekarang menjadi seorang pendidik yang sangat luar biasa dan memberikan perubahan di medan ini. Ya saya harap sesi ini dapat berguna kepada Bapak Ibu sekalian dan ada yang bisa dibawa pulang. Baiklah Bapak Ibu sekalian. Sekarang kami akan lanjut lagi ada satu sesi terakhir yang sangat luar biasa yang akan dilakukan oleh empat narasumber yang juga merupakan empat pengusaha di Medan yang lumayan besar, besar sekali yang itu ada Diva Putri Aryani, Roger D. Jerick, John Paul dan El Noviani yang berlokasi di auditorium jadi tempat tadi kita datang pas grand opening itu ya lokasinya ada di sana dan Acaranya akan dimulai 15 menit lagi Jadi terima kasih untuk Bapak Ibu sekalian Sekali lagi saya ingatkan untuk mengisi website bit.live feedbacks sml1.2019.com Sudah tahu website-nya Bapak Ibu sekalian? Uh, ada speedol tidak ya? Atau mungkin bisa diketik di sini aja website-nya Atau tolong bentuk tulisnya aja bit.live slash feedbacks sml feedbacks sml2019.com Ya jadi Bapak Ibu mohon diberikan feedback mungkin kepada narasumbernya ada yang bisa diberikan kalau ada yang bisa ditingkatkan lagi untuk ke depannya dan juga kepada moderator apakah ada yang baik bisa dijelaskan ada yang buruk bisa dijelaskan baiknya juga ya baiklah Bapak Ibu sekalian terima kasih dan sampai jumpa